along with Budweiser and HBO Sports. We proudly dedicate tonight's event to the memory of a figure who represents peace and brotherhood, the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Twelve rounds of boxing for the WBA Welterweight Championship of the World. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing the black trunks with red trim, and weighing in at 146 and one half pounds, his professional record. 34 victories with only two losses. His KO power has been demonstrated 24 times. Ladies and gentlemen, from Plainfield, New Jersey, the number three ranked welterweight in the world, the challenger, the network, the real beast, Brown. And across the ring in the blue corner, Wearing the black trunks with on, multi color trim and weighing in at 146 and one quarter pounds. You're the best boxer in the world. Remember that, Jeff. You're the best boxer in the world. I'm the world. champion with a full record of 28 victories against only one you. defeat with one draw and 15 KOs. He comes from a hometown with a great boxing legacy with names like Monroe and Watts, Benton and Briscoe, champions such as Johnson and Giraudello, Saad Muhammad and Smoke and Joe. Now, his boyhood dreams are fulfilled for as a two-time world champion. He is among the elite of the Philly fighting fraternity. You, baby. Ladies and you. gentlemen, the pride of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, presenting the WBA this is you. This welterweight is you. champion of the world, Meldrick TNT. Gentlemen, you both received your pre-fight instructions. I expect a clean break at all times. I'm looking forward to a clean contest. Good luck to both of you. Let's touch gloves. Touch up. The question in my mind, gentlemen, is whether Meldrick Taylor, like the Liberty Bell, can be cracked. And if he is cracked, whether he can hold up under it and keep on chiming. Well, you heard Lou Duva in the background there, having just finished his work with Pernell Whitaker, pumping up Meldrick Taylor by telling him, Meldrick, come on, you're the best boxer in the world. Glenwood Brown will be trying to set up a left hook. That's his money punch. There wasn't one ounce of sweat on Brown before the fight. Makes you wonder if he can be knocked down quick. Yeah, that's not good, is it, George? It's kind of dangerous when you're with a snappy puncher like Mildred Taylor. He can clip you quick in the first couple of rounds. There was a time when experts would tell you that unquestionably Taylor had the fastest hands of any substantive weight fighter in the world. He has not looked quite as quick as a welterweight as was the case at 140 pounds. Taylor throws a lot of punches and he throws them quick, but he has a tendency not to look at what he's throwing at, which means he lands a lot on the elbows and on top of gloves. And he has a tendency also, George, as he gets excited and throws in flurries, to diminish the power of his punches. So That's right. Like when you think about throwing six punches, you forget about power in one. It just doesn't go like that. Brown starts off trying to use the jab. And in doing so, he has elected the jab with a jab. Not only that, it seems to me he's better prepared this time to box, as did the Mildred Taylor or uh, Maurice Blocker fight. Leading with right hand. Yep. Moment of off balance there for Glenwood Brown as he fell back. Two exchanges, and in both of them, Taylor has been able to land two to Brown's one. Brown had better be careful. You just don't pick on Philadelphia fighters. They got good left hooks in their pocket. Well, Meldrick thinks of himself as a body puncher, a left hooker to the body. He thinks that's his best blow. Brown doesn't seem to have any particular tactic in mind yet. Letting the fight develop, and then he's thinking about he's going to take over later on. Solid right hand by Taylor over the top. Backs Brown up. A lot of that has to do with not being in no sweat on his body yet. 
and he can just drop a good right like now. Left hook to the body by Brown, and Taylor landed left in return. Keep him up. Stay off that hip. That punch hurt me to Taylor. He landed right on the tip of uh, Brown's elbow. All right, let him go. Let him go. There is a glimpse. Right, it's off the three you, left hooks to the body by Taylor. Nice and clean. The thing about throwing roundhouse punches, you got to be prepared to hurt those knuckles. Fight goes on five or six rounds. Get out sore hands. Almost finished with a relatively tactical round one in which Melger Taylor seems to have had a slight advantage until that body shot put him down. That was the Glenwood Brown left hook to the body, and I think the punch landed before the bell, so it should be scored as an upset. And that woke up the crowd. round and in a sense the round is a replica or a metaphor for his fight against Chavez. He had everything under control until the very end. He got careless, threw a big left hand and caught one back in return. And of all the things, a left hook from Philadelphia. A left hook puts the Philadelphia fighter down. I said to the body, as you saw in the replay, it actually caught him on the point of the chin as he was leaning in. And now Brown tries to go to work to capitalize. And we have the beginnings of a war. A lot of people thought that Glenwood Brown's punching power might pose a problem for Taylor. I can tell you this, he's a power puncher, but Taylor can regroup himself. He's a great boxer, turn things around really quick. Goes back to being at home with all your managers and trainers telling you what to do. Brown's right hand landed flush on Taylor's mouth. And another left landed in there. This is the time for Taylor to be careful. And because he's at home, he's got something to prove. He may end up getting knocked down again. Well, when Glenwood Brown fought for the title against Maurice Blocker, he was in Atlantic City with a lot of his home fans from Plainfield, New Jersey, having made the trip down. And when he hurt Blocker in the third and fourth rounds, he says he forgot his fight plan and spent the rest of the fight trying to knock him out, playing into the technician Blocker's hand. We'll see if Taylor does the same thing here against Glenwood Brown. Brown is being smart. He's making Milton Taylor come to him. Seldom you see a puncher do that. Mentally, that one left hook and the knockdown have turned the fight around. That's right, it, right and uh, Taylor doesn't even know that he's still dizzy from that. He may do something foolish like keep mixing it up, get dropped again. Right uppercut landed inside for Brown. Taylor is landing in these exchanges as well, but his punches are not as hard as those of the power puncher, Glenwood Brown. When you're knocked down, that's the time to get back. Listen to your corner. Pay attention to instruction. Don't go slugging it out again. He knocked you down when you had a clear head. What can you do when you're a bit dizzy? Look at Meldrick dropping the right hand and trying to load it up, George. All right, right, right. Wide Hang swinging as he goes to the body in there. This is not what George Benton most wants to see from his fighter. Taylor has gotten upset. He's mad. There's no way his corner can come in down at this point. They're trading uppercuts, trading left hooks. There's blood on Glenwood Brown's forehead and above his left eye. Boy, a good right to the body by Glenwood Brown. I think Taylor has managed to nick Brown above the left eye. And not only has he waken up a demon. And now the blood is starting to flow. And there's no question Glenwood Brown is cut around the left eye. Which is why Taylor raised his arms at the end of that round. He felt he had paid him back.
got it. All right. Yeah. 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 Enough. Yeah, so don't try to get in no fight, but if you're sticking and standing, and, and, and uh, you got 10, ten, ten more rounds to go. Keep them on balance. Just like balance. You see the punch that actually cuts round. It's a long, looping right hand. There it is, right there. Cut does not appear to be in a dangerous place right now unless the blood keeps running into the eye. It's on the forehead, not on the eyelid. No, Taylor wasn't even looking at that shot. No, just throwing wild. And he might have caught him with the thumb of the glove, which always helps to open up the cut. Glenwood Brown's cut man, veteran Al Gavin, is a good one. He did his work between rounds. There's no trace of blood on Glenwood right now. Could be pretty good for Brown. This will make him a bit more apprehensive. Could be a hit on point at this time. Make this guy commit himself. Both fighters a little more cautious to begin round three. Brown was a bit overconfident, a little cocky, not knowing who he was in the ring with. You gotta ask yourself, how many times Mildred Taylor has been down in Joe Frazier's gym? Since he was eight years old. Judy Battle telling the fighters to watch their heads. In case you're new to the sport and have trouble telling them apart, the man closest to you, now on the left, is Glenwood Brown. The man now closest to you, and circling to his left, is Meldrick Taylor. Keep him up now. All right, Frank, let him go. Step out. Step out. Right hand Keep landed by Taylor. Taylor has his protective cup exposed. Goes to show you good trainers like to have big cups. Nice Doesn't matter if they're exposed, just protect yourself. Glenwood Brown with the right to the body landed right on the point of Meldrick's elbow. That hurts the man who throws the punch. Taylor's trying to get a jab started, but he's afraid to overcommit himself by stepping in too far. And that's what you gotta do with an elusive guy as Brown is trying to play tonight. Meldrick seems to be settling down a little bit. There's no question he was hyper excited in round two. Nobody expected Brown to be a boxer like he is tonight. All right, Frank, come now come Brown go. begins to wing his punches just a little wider. No fighters can keep up that pace. They started off at a fast pace. No matter what weight you are, it's got to burn you out a little bit. But the less Brown jabs, George, the more opportunity there is for Meldrick to do it and establish it as a boxing match. So there they traded hard punches again. Well, Brown is playing counterpunch tonight, making Taylor do what he doesn't like to do. Commit yourself. Commit yourself. I'm going to make you pay. Another left hook landed for Brown, and Taylor's in trouble again. I think more than anything, it was a slip that could really ignite Brown, though. And Meldrick's trying to prove it. Right now, he's trying to show it was just a slip, but he's got Brown all excited, and Glenwood's getting the oh, best of it as they pound oh, against the ropes. Understand? Stand right up there. Make your jabs count. Don't okay. flinch him out here. Okay. You understand? You're a better boxer. Let's see what happened in the corner there. What happened there was that round cut. Taylor flat footed, and he went a little off balance. It wasn't that part of the punch. Taylor still has his protective cup. Exposed. What does that mean, George? It means not only is it protecting where it's supposed to, it's also protecting his stomach. Yeah, it's know? high. Yeah. And consequently, punches on the red part of the cup are not going to be scored as low blows. They're going to be scoring blows for the Nice and clean. 
Brown, if he just takes it easy now, just play boxer for a few rounds. Let this guy overcommit himself trying to catch up and tag it. Taylor's in a bad position now. He's having to play aggressor. Through three rounds, Meldrick Taylor landing only 28% of his jabs, according to punch stat numbers. His trainers would like to see him do better. Meldrick now doubling and tripling up on the jab. Only when, go ahead, George. Only when Brown decides to stand still. The more dynamic Brown is, the less he's going to be caught with the jab. Linwood is starting to wing all his shots wide from the outside now. And that's going to leave the middle open for Meldrick. And that's what Taylor's trying to take advantage of right now with the jab. Taylor's a fine fighter, but he doesn't know how to go forward with a left jab. Not many guys can. Left hook by Brown. That hurt Taylor. Taylor invites Glenwood in. Taylor's corner is coming to the jab to do something he don't know how to do forward. With the left hook by Taylor. Two to the body, one to the face. Brown vision is also impaired about this time. He's seeing double. Nobody knows it. Right hand by Taylor. The night may be the night. We'll find out if Meldrick really has welterweight punching power because he's getting his opportunity. Let him out nice and clean. And he's likely to get more as the fight goes on. that Taylor can punch, but he's got to make sure he's looking at what he's doing. He's throwing a lot of punches, but I'm paying attention where they go. Another left hook by Glenwood Brown, and this is going to be another knock. Four, five, second time in the fight Seven, that Melvick Taylor has eight, been knocked down. Crowd booing, they thought it should have been a slip. No, should have been a knockdown. Good call. The difference, Brown is looking to his corner even after he knocks Taylor down. Taylor hasn't looked to his corner yet. Like, I'm doing this with my pals at home. I don't need you for the people. Very dangerous, these hometowns. Yeah. Round four, punctuated by the second knockdown in the fight. Both times, it has been the challenger, Glenwood Brown, who's had the champion on the canvas. This guy can't yeah. see the handle yeah. of the Now, you got a jab in his chest. Put this on his chest. He's jabbing his, like, like you're aiming at his neck. You understand? Four rounds into the fight, one third of the action gone. Harold Letterman, how do you score? Jim, it's very, very interesting in the scoring. I've got a two rounds each, 38 to 37, a one point lead for Glenwood Brown. Now, I give Glenwood Brown an extra point in the first round because I thought it was a really clean, good, effective knockdown. But in the fourth round, I really got the opinion that uh, the Meldrick Taylor slipped and, and I had a 10 9 Glenwood Brown in that fourth round. So I've got Glenwood by a point. The thing to keep in mind here, as we watch this, that was not a clear, a clean knockdown. Obviously, it was a he, it was a part slip, part push, part punch. But, but if the officials are giving these uh, rounds 10-8 to Brown, Taylor has dug himself a hole real quick. He has time to dig out of it or climb out of it, but uh, he's going to have to go to work soon and put some real hurt on this kid because the kid is bold now. He is sticking to his fight plan because it's been so successful, and Taylor has to do something to break him out of it. As a matter of fact, Brown doesn't realize that they were slips. He thinks, hey, I'm tough. Well, and you've got both uh, Larry and Harold over there saying that they thought it was as much slip as punch. I'm going to be the one who says I think there's enough of a punch there to count for a knockdown. Whether you call it a 10-8 round is another question. I agree with you. Some power was exchanged. Thank you, George. Round five of an increasingly interesting championship fight. Brown now clearly the aggressor, emboldened, as you say, George, by the success he's had. And the thing about Brown that's so interesting and correct, he throws hard shots and then step back. Taylor has to keep coming forward to dominate this fight. He keeps running into awkward shots. And as George Benton and Lou Duba pointed out to him, getting off balance from time to time.
Bill is more comfortable building up points. And now he's trying for one shot to show his hometown. I can knock this guy down. Don't give up on me. Well, he's certainly a slick enough boxer that he ought to be able to whitewash Brown the rest of the way. If he settles down, concentrates on his jab and on movement, and uses his natural gifts. But he wants to fight with Glenwood Brown, and I think he's playing into the challenger's hand. That's because he's embarrassed. His hometown and seeing him get up off the canvas twice. What do you do? You don't go boxing now. They're going to call you chicken at home. Maybe a little of the same thing that happened to Evander Holyfield in Atlanta. I'm going to over and press your hometown. If I fight in my hometown, there would be no one but Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Out of shape, as a matter of fact. Well, Five next, days notice. Your next fight is with us, boss, and we ain't going to let you fight Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Much as the public might like to see it. <laughs> Brown is in a real comfortable position. Every fighter wants the opportunity to box, especially when you're a puncher. Nobody believes that you can box. Right, and he's doing, he's about to spin. Nice and clean. Milton Stop. Taylor. Chopping overhand right landed for Taylor in there, then another right hand. But we've seen absolutely no bleeding since round two from the cut over Glenwood Brown's eye, meaning cut man Al Gavin has done his job. Good right hand by Brown. Set up by the left. And now Brown is jabbing again, as he did in the first round. Oh, no, come on, I got him down. Don't worry about it. No, yeah. Oh, I want to listen to this. Listen to me. Give me that water. And put the towel. Towel for the chest. You know why? See, you're walking through my hand. You see what he's doing, man. Hey, Steve. You know why? I need that tail. No. Yeah, yeah. Just put it over there a little further. Six rounds. See, you catch it on the swings. So you just walk right on up behind, but not, don't run up, just walk up behind your jab. And when you play, just get down from the swings like you was doing just a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. Water and ice out of this yeah, corner. Okay. All right. If anything has been shown in this fight up to now, aside from the fact that Benwood Brown is very much in it, and probably lead. It's that when Brown hits Taylor a clean shot, he puts some hurt on him. And Taylor hits Brown a clean shot. Uh, he may sting him, but I can't say he's hurt him. Not only so, when Taylor lands a good shot on Brown, he never tries to pay him back. It's not so vice versa. Well, I like a fighter who wants to pay back right away and tell, tell his opponent, I'm not let, gonna let you get away with it. You shouldn't get wild, but you gotta do something right now. You got a point there. Taylor's got some pretty big muscles, you know? You just don't try to feel a big guy like that back. But as big as his muscles are and as great as Melton Taylor's natural gifts are, there are those who love punching power who will point out that Glenwood Brown has spent his whole pro career as a power punching welterweight, and Melvick Taylor is a former 140 pound technician who has become 147 pound. Right, let him go. Stop punching. And able to land a good right hand, Melvick Taylor. Solid right hand. His protective cup is not exposed so much this time. Good left to the body by Taylor. Brown going back to the jab he used in round one and then later abandoned. again for Brown. This time, Taylor walked through it. And again. Taylor is saying, when you want to box, I'm going to fight. I'm sorry, Brown is saying, when you want to fight, I'm going to box, Taylor. And when you want to box, I'm going to fight. Right hand to the body, just missed with the left hook. Brown had dug another left hook to Taylor's ribs just before that. He's not punching as much as Meldrick, but his punches are very effective when they land. He's starting to stand back and see if he's done any damage. That could be a problem. problem for Brown. Throw the punch, the guy foul, forget it. If he doesn't, forget it. Yeah, that's a habit Pernell Whitaker said that he had developed a couple of fights Good ago. right hand by Brown. Yep. And this time he didn't admire his work, George. This time he went back to work. 
Tate can admire your work after the fight, right? He's smart enough to know that Taylor's going to try and pay him back after every hard punch he hits him with. So you hit him hard and jump back and box. Taylor getting increasingly accurate with the jab when he gets a chance to use it. There's one. Good left hook by Brown. These punches don't show a lot, but they make you dizzy. So you stand and you fake, but in, in reality, you can't see very well. Boy, this is an interesting battle. Let him go, let him go, let him go. Nice and clean, step out. Uh, shifting tactical flow. The two fighters trying different things. Hard bout to score. Gonna be interesting to see what happens if it goes the distance. When you throw a hook, you gotta follow it. Double hooks, double hooks, not single. And then what? Wait till you get that. It's, it's gonna bend down on you. When you throw that left uh, that couple of hooks, bend with him, hook in the body, and then straighten him out with the right hand to the chin. Short. Keep cool. Don't lose your cool. The jab at his chest and at his belly too. You understand? Because look, see when when the guy is moving back like that. To swing at you. You got to draw way back in and swing at you. You'll see the punch coming. See? But if you station there, you, you know, you might not see the punch coming. As long as you got it moving, you'll always see his power. So keep it moving back. Keep it moving back, right? I'm not that jab snap that jab. A chest and belly. Look, snap it, jab. You understand that? Right? Seventh round. Snap that jab. Don't wait out there. Snap it out there. One thing we have to keep in mind as we go into the second half of the fight. That is, Let's go. That Taylor is fighting in his hometown which means he's likely to get the benefit of the doubt in close rounds. He, he may still be behind, but he still has half the fight to catch up and go ahead. Mildred Taylor with his exposed cup. No aggressor. He doesn't get low enough. In order to go after a guy, you got to get low. Left hook landed for Taylor after the overhand right. He got the best of that exchange. Corner and Glenwood Brown back Meltrick up with another left hook flush on the jaw. Taylor is trying to be aggressive, but his head is a bit too high. You got to get that head down so that you don't get hit, hit back. Well, he landed two solid punches in there, but again, it was Brown's left hook which backed Taylor back out of the corner. Whenever Taylor makes any forward motion punches, he just doesn't seem to know what to do. But when he's able to stand still for a second, Brown, she hurts Brown. Would you advise Meldrick to stick with the jab, George? What he's going to have to do is go in and just fight this guy for about two, two minutes, and then let this Brown come to him a bit. He's going tat for tat. Brown has no reason to attack him. Right hand in the corner, temporarily immobilizes Glenwood Brown, and now Brown comes back with a left hook again. Brown is starting to make that mistake now of trying to pay back. He may end up on the canvas. If Meldrick has the sock to put him down. Meldrick's previous welterweight championship fights against Aaron Davis and Luis Garcia, 12 round decisions. Taylor would be very contented if Brown start to attack him. Thing that's driving Milky Taylor crazy is that Brown will not come forward. He hits him and back away. And this corner told him earlier, double up on that hook and come in with a right hand. He's trying to find that hook. Brown is looking for that double left hook in the right hand. Taylor, the busier fighter as we come to the end of round seven. Brown still landing slightly the more effective punch. Then you gotta take the, the play away from him when he gives one punch. Then you gotta go into a rough, rough uh, 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 tactic. You gotta move your body, you move a hook, hook, keep a hook going. Hook, hook, and down in the body. 
when you do that. Because the jab is keeping him from him. Losing more, that's the point that's working for you. Now remember, jab at his belly, jab at his chest. Because you're getting under all this stuff, you see where you're swinging at. Oh, you got Watch how Brown stands in there when Taylor flurries and fires back. He fires back correctly to the body. Here again, Taylor has the best of it, but Brown hangs right in there so that he's in punching range to deliver his own shots. Let's cut him right. Stay back in your corner. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Well, it's been anything but dull through seven rounds of the World Championship fight between champion Beldrick Taylor on the right of your screen and challenger Glenwood Brown on the left. Remember that Taylor has been down twice in the fight. Once in the first round, and that set the tone for the Glenwood Brown left hook, which has been a constant thorn in Taylor's side here. When Beldrick jabs, he dominates the action. When he goes inside the trade with Glenwood Brown, he often takes at least as good as he gives. Brown is using his jab a bit more effective this round. Solid left by Taylor, and Brown stands up and comes back. Oh, no, 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 no. That's going to be called a slip by Rudy Bass. Well, I think it's a slip because of the previous punch. That left hook by Meldrick against the ropes was the heaviest blow he's thrown in the fight. Brown, though he's demonstrated power, still decides to box. Stay away from the power. Meldrick's hand speed is starting to make a difference here. You see him landing two and three blows now at close quarters for every one that Glenwood is able to throw. Remember, after each active round with Mildred Taylor, he has to take a break the next following round. Which means he can get hurt the next round. But he's winning this round big, and chances are he needs to pile up points to try to offset the damage done by the two knockdowns. Brown is still smart not to be over aggressive. Get the knockdown when they come. Don't go looking for them. You may find a knuckle set. Good lead right hand by Brown. Step back. A knuckle sandwich. I haven't heard that one in a while. Whenever Brown decides to be flat footed, Mildred Taylor is the by far the best jabber. He plays two, three jabs. quick punches, but he's not looking at it. Now Brown is tiring a little bit, and Meldrick's hand speed is coming to the floor. No question about that. Brown is using his legs a lot more than Mildred Taylor, so he's going to be the tower of the two. He right landed for Brown and set up the left hook. Whenever he turns around it. again, again. Whenever he leaves with that right hand, Brown is being real effective with it. Except for the one brief flurry toward the end, round eight seemed to belong to Meldrick Taylor. Frank, he's taking the play away from you now. It's no good. He's throwing one punch and uh, two or three punches, only throwing one. You, you must, you must throw. The minute you finish, you've got to move it, move that head fast and follow this guy with hook to the chin and to the, to the body. Body to the chin, body to the chin, chin to the body. Harold Letterman. Move it up and down, uh, up and down, official. up and down with that left hook. How do you, you score the fight? Larry, I've got it 77, 74, six rounds to two, Meldrick Taylor. Larry, what's grabbing my eye uh, and my attention is the fact that Meldrick Taylor's landing a tremendous amount of combinations while Glenwood Brown seems to be landing one at a time. I think it's the flash of Meldrick Taylor that's catching the eye of the judges. I think he's piling up points by just throwing his combinations. Constantly. I have the fight five rounds to three for Taylor. But if you throw in those two knockdowns into the equation, it could be an even fight. Hard about the score. My guess is up for grabs as they go to the last four rounds. As a matter of fact, I favor Brown. He's been doing an excellent job of boxing. He's one of the harder punches of throw. He's the deliverer. 
So you think he might have the edge with the scorecard? Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind, but uh, I'm dealing on emotions, of course. No, no, George. You are a full critical analyst here. <laughs> Let me guess why you favor the puncher, George. <laughs> <laughs> When a guy has suffered two knockdowns and he continues to box. Well, if you remember rounds one and two, we had the beginnings of a war. No, Just no. Just for a few moments there, 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 that kind of action had returned to the fight. Haley is starting to flurry and just throw a lot of shots. Putting on the show now. He didn't look at either punch he just delivered. But the guy drops his hand, he knocks him down. Let's see how carefully Glenwood Brown is listening to Victor Valley, who told him between rounds, when Melton throws two, three, four punches at a time, he must come back. Good enough hook by Milton Taylor. And another. Brown lands the left and just misses the right. But again, a lot of those punches are hitting the elbow, hurting the hands. It's still hard for the judges not to be dazzled by the fluid motion, George, and the ability to throw those punches in bunches. Even if only one out of six lands, when you hear the thud, you think he's doing something. That was a good exchange. And of course, as a judge, never realize that they're all in Philadelphia. Good right hand that almost dropped Mildred Taylor. Straight up the middle, and Glenwood hasn't thrown that many punches up the middle except for the rare occasions when he's gone to the dead. Those right hand leads have landed every time, as you point out, George. And if he wants to set up the left hook again, that may be the way to do it. And you know, Mildred is getting very elusive. He's not standing up for the liver. He let him hit it with the right hand, but he's not coming back with a good enough hook. Brown is clever enough to just jab a bit, jab a bit, and then go back to the right hand lead. Great right hand landed for Meldrick Taylor. Brown was trying to tempt Meldrick into the corner with him. Meldrick just stepped across on the right hand and hit it flush. Good left hook by Brown. That hurt. Good great right hand. hand. Yeah, that's right. He can do that. It's available to him. a hard one to score. Our guys seem to give the edge to Taylor. You have to do better. Now you got to start getting a little rough. You're giving him round by slide. Slide margin. Understand? By petting the jab. You're waiting too much to get your punches in. Now you got to get rough. You got to get rough now in this round. Put the jab in front of you. Keep that jab in front of you. Suck it up. Now look. Suck it up. You got to stand it up. You got to keep this fucking jab going. But don't let the guy take you back. You keep him going back with the jab. Now listen. Turn your hands. You gotta get it now. You gotta take it from him. You gotta take it, baby. Come on. Take it. Come on. Short with those punches. Come on. Yeah. Hands up, man. I'm gonna work now, baby. Snap that jab and back him up. Go, go, go low on the jab. Go low on it. This round gets rough. As Victor Valley advised him, is he going to leave himself open to get hit with some hard punches? I see the same thing. He better not get too careless. Mr. Taylor, his corner has exposed his cup again, and they've told him to go with the jab a bit more. And when he's working his jab, he's by far the more superior fighter. Well, he's thrown a total of 316 jabs in the first nine rounds and landed over 100 of them, 35%. It's a good enough connect percentage to give him a chance to hold the edge in the fight if, as George Benton tells him, he keeps doing it. Yeah, if he keeps that jab going, he's a superior fighter. But if not, Brown is going to get him occasional knockdown. And as you pointed out, George, Meldrick's ego comes into play here, fighting in his hometown against the guy who has put him on the canvas. This is the first round I had seen him follow instruction by way of his corner. He saw the users there. Even when he was hurt, he could change it to use his left. These are the championship rounds. It's Meldrick Taylor's job as the title holder to make his fight in these last three rounds. Good 
Body punch by Taylor. That really hurt Brown. And Meldrick steps back to admire his work a little bit. Incidentally, that slick spot on the left side of Glenwood Brown's head is a large portion of Vaseline aimed at helping to keep the cut closed over his left eye. Taylor has decided he's not going to be tired. You get up against the rope, five punches at the maximum. He's not going to try anymore. He's saving his juice for the last time. So he's going to go in and land four or five and then step back up. Rather than keep throwing. Maybe he was tired once in his career. Maybe twice. Who knows? Maybe he was knocked down in the last round. Well, he will always tell you, over and over, that he learned a lesson in the 12th round against Julio Cesar Chavez, and he'll never make that mistake again. And he's opening up with a lead right hand now that hurts Brown. Well, and right hand by Brown. Glenwood senses an opportunity to step up again. Punches like that, your muscles get real tight. The mountain climbers seem to bounce around and just shake your fist to get loose again. Meldrick Taylor trying to answer Glenwood Brown's challenge. Great round. Come on, Junior, do it again. You gotta take him. Don't wait for this guy now. Now we got we to fight very close over here now. You made this fight close. Now breathe in all the way in. All the way in. And it's. OK? Come on. You got me coming? You listening to me? Put your head down. Now go out there and jam the shit out of this guy. Hey, OK? We need this round. We need this round. We need this round. We need this This is big time action here. There you see Brown following the orders of his corner. To get, to get to work to brawl more. He punches himself a little out a little here, and Taylor will respond because of it. There's the left hook that stopped him in his tracks, changed things around. A lot of the punches that Taylor throw are like a cat in a corner, if you know what I mean. Let's get that water! He's trying to fight the, the guy off of him. He's not really trying to beat him. He's just like, get off of me, give me a break. But Taylor has found a formula for fighting here since those first few rounds. Not to get too wild and leave himself exposed. Just box, box, box. Take what takes what take what comes. Uh, use his advantage at hand speed. Just don't get nailed by any real hard country. Brown got in a pitch it book, left hook, right on the chin. Yep, a hard, clean left hook. The time that he is not supposed to get nailed by. Now he goes back to jabbing. Just as George Benton told him, when he jabs, he dominates the act. When he stands and trades, he's making a mistake. That Taylor's starting to bounce around and get a bit more aggressive. He start, should have done these things a little earlier. Brown feeling the top of his head after a near head butt to melt it. Brown has given everybody a boxing lesson tonight, especially the doofers. There's been a lot of cussing in the corner. Well, it's one of those fights in which right, even if Glenwood Brown move. turns out That's the right. loser, he is probably going to gain in stature because he's shown here tonight that he can do some things that people question. Could he change his style as a fighter? Could he box with a boxer? Could he land that left hook in close quarters against a man as quick as Meldrick Taylor? He's answered all those questions positively. Even if he loses, I think he's a bigger man coming out of this. Medicine Square God, Brown with one hand down at this point. Good kind of punches by Taylor. Both fighters going to the body. Taylor getting the best of the exchange. Brown missing over the top with a left and a right. It might have given him the advantage. The thing 
that we consider conditioning. After the other fighter deliver all his shots, you got to get right back on him. That takes him out of conditioning. These fighters haven't been trained to do that. Well, both fighters are in pretty doggone good shape, though, George. This is round 11, and there's been very little let up. Amen to that. But they seem to throw punches at the same time. One has got to capitalize when the other guy's finished. to box in this last round. He's got to go for the knockout punch. 11 rounds in the books, and this has been a terrific fight. All right, let's start over here and get shot. He's here, but he's shit out of him. Take care of him, I'll take care of the punch. This is mine. Yeah, we got to throw punches. Let's press, press, press. I want you to get under the punches. But if you run from the punches, you get hit. You see what I mean? You understand? Suck it up, Don't trade with it. Make it miss him, make it miss him. Last round, we touched nothing. We decided to jump on you and make a stand. Be smart with it. Don't run from him, but just try to box it. You understand? But make it miss and then make him pay. Take it. Take it from him. Keep your hands short. Keep it to the side. Keep the head rolling. But keep the gap in front of you and move in with the two hands. Harold, how do you have it? Larry, 106, 102, eight rounds to three, a four-point lead for Meldrick Taylor going into the last round. I'm just impressed by Meldrick Taylor's hand speed. I think he's four points in front at this point. May not be quite that one-sided on the scorecards of the judges, although, of course, we point out Philadelphia is Meldrick Taylor's hometown. Three minutes to go. And I see a lot of worried looking faces around ringside and in this auditorium of people who aren't sure that their man, Meldrick Taylor, is indeed ahead in this fight. Well, it's hard for a lot of uninitiated observers to understand, Larry, how a man can be on the canvas twice and come back to win the fight. Exactly. That indeed will be what Taylor has accomplished if he's been able to do. If this was a foot race, I'd say Taylor pulled ahead a little bit in the last round. But Brown, a lot better athlete than people suppose. If he had been at home, a lot better tonight. Glenwood Brown landed another left hook on the button. Meldrick Taylor has now proven he can take that one. Second title shot for Glenwood Brown. A man who was clinically dead from Browning at age 14 or 15 and was brought back to life by resuscitation. He thought it was his destiny to win this fight and have a championship. He's trying for a knockout, but he's trying to do it with one punch at a time. Just doesn't have that much time. Now, Brown better mix it up. He spent the whole fight going backward and countering effectively. It's hard to turn around and come forward and brawl now. That's right. It's hard to change boats in the middle of the screen. All at the end of it. Eldrick Taylor standing and trading in the corner. Lou Duba and George Benton looking on nervously. Blood over the right eye of Glenwood Brown now. Weight title winning effort against Aaron Davis. Eldrick has not decided to turn and run with a possible lead on the scorecards in round 12. Seems nothing to want a knockout. Nothing can be left to chance. I think you're right. Milton seems to want a knockout. He wanted to pay the to the home crowd a knockout. But he gave Glenwood Brown one other chance to land the left hook and smiled at him after Glenwood threw. Brown really respects Taylor at this point. Ten seconds to go. I'll tell you, if you do a rematch in Madison Square Garden, you can see another winner. Come together. Good bout. Good bout, Bill. Yeah, yeah, good bout. Yeah. All champions. 
run into fights like this, the question is, can they recruit him to do It appears to me that Meldrick Taylor did so. Fox out there. Great fight. Great fight, Jimmy. Great fight. Come on, cut these off. Cut these off. You fought a hell of a fight out there, baby. Very close. That's my fight. That's my fault. Come on, Judy. Your fight. It's my fault. It's my fight. I won that fight. Come on, Jimmy. Come You fought a hell of a fight. Smart fight, I told you, baby. All right, Harold. I told you were. Give us your score. You were the guy. You were the guy. Jim, Mike. My typical Philadelphia decision, 116, 111, nine rounds to three favorite Meldrick Taylor. Jim, I just was impressed with Meldrick's hand, with Meldrick's hand speed, with him backing up Glenwood Brown all night. I just really felt that uh, Meldrick Taylor dominated the fight. Somebody busted up Glenwood Brown, and Rudy Battle never laid a hand on him. So I, I just think that Meldrick Taylor did enough and uh, was aggressive enough, moved forward enough, threw enough combinations to uh, get a five-point win over Glenwood Brown tonight. You agree, George, that uh, Meldrick pulled it out? I do agree. He pulled the fight out, but it was only in the last couple of rounds. Uh, he let the judges know, if you give me the decision, I deserve it. Yeah. And let's take another look at one of the two knockdowns hey, in Casey. the fight. There were knockdowns in both the first and fourth rounds. The fourth round knockdown a little bit questionable, but the first round knockdown right at the end of that stanza is unquestionable, as you'll see the left hook right on Meldrick Taylor's chin, and it put him on the canvas after a round in which Taylor had boxed very well. That gave Brown great confidence. He came back and fought a war in the second round, but wound up with a cut over his eye, and it was an aggressive battle all the way through. Right now, let's go to ring announcer Michael Buffer to clear up all the suspense. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for Glenwood Brown and Meldrick Taylor. We go to the scorecards. Nicasio Drake scores about 114 to 113. Steve Smoker has it, 116 to 113. Patricia Jarman, also 116 to 113 for the winner by unanimous decision. And Steve. Yeah! Down. A down. very disappointed Glenwood Brown. You heard him Ladies saying, it's my fight. I won that fight. The judges go the same direction as our Harold Letterman, agreeing with Harold and Larry and George Foreman that Meldrick Taylor came back to win the fight. Punch stat shows the reason why. A much busier fighter. Taylor throwing 400 more punches in the bout than did his opponent, Glenwood Brown. That was the statistic that makes the difference. And here's Larry Merchant with the champ. <laughs> you were beautiful out there. You boxed that Champ, fight. that was uh, one of your tougher fights. Why? Because he's a very tough guy. You know, he's no right number one in the world. He surprised you with his power in the early rounds? Uh, I had an idea he was a big puncher. He caught me a good shot early in the round, but I came back, you know, so. Did he hurt you when he knocked you down, or did you just get careless and reckless and get nailed some punches. I got careless because I stood right in front of him. Lou was telling me, don't stand there in front of me. He threw a wild left hook and caught me on the end of my chin. It didn't hurt me. I got right up. I was in good shape. Got back up and covered. What was the plan after that? How did you regroup? Well, I was there to keep my damn hands up. <laughs> you don't stand in front of him. Basically, I use that jab. Keep my back. Every time I used that jab, he was backing up. So. As long as I was losing that jab, was, the fight was going my way. Were you embarrassed in front of your hometown crowd to get knocked down twice in one fight? No, I wasn't embarrassed because that's what champ is made of. To be able to take a good shot and maybe come right back. and I, I wasn't embarrassed at all, no. You hit him some good shots. He, keep, he kept coming at you. He hit you some shots, and he seemed to stun you. Do you just not have the power in this division? Well, I heard him a couple times, but if I was looking to go knock him off, I could have finished him. I wasn't looking for a knockout. I was looking to box him for 12 rounds, put him in a boxing clinic. But if I wanted to go for the knockout, I could have stepped up the pressure and kept at least a lot of punches. A lot of times I caught him on the ropes and backed up. Okay, what is next? Do you want to unify the welterweight championships, uh, blocker, or do you want to go ahead back 
to Chavez? Of course, we will see the Chavez. That's the only guy that I want in this world is Chavez. I want the rematch soon, very soon. If you can't get together with him and make a deal, what then? Well, we're going to try to fight for unify the um, titles, consolidate the other two titles with McGurk and Maurice Blocker. Um, McGurk was talking about he want to fight me, so let's sign now. Let's, let's sign a contract. Well, this sounds like it's going to be an interesting year for you, Meldrick. Congratulations on winning, on defending your title successfully. Back to you, Jim. All right, Larry and George Foreman, I think someday you'll probably be training and advising young fighters if you ever retire from the ring again. What lessons should Meldrick Taylor, the champion, have learned from this experience? Well, a major lesson is the old song goes, Mama said there'd be days like these. <laughs> but first of all, you're not going to be able to outbox every guy. You're going to have to learn how to get in there and dig these things out, be the best puncher. He learned that lesson tonight. This fight was not given to him. He earned every drop of it. What about the question of whether he has enough punching power to be an effective welterweight champion. He couldn't knock Brown down. Brown knocked him down twice. Do you knock Meldrick's punching power? Well, you Brown didn't go in he, uncautiously. He hesitated. It means he tasted some power tonight. He didn't just run over Mildred Taylor. He was a bit hesitant because he tasted some power. Meldrick's in his middle 20s. Can he still develop more power? Oh, he's just a growing boy. He's not even wet behind the ear yet. <laughs> All right, well, you heard Glenwood Brown earlier claiming that he thought it was his fight, and I'm sure there are a lot of people here and elsewhere who'll agree with him. Let's go to Larry Merchant to hear from the vanquished challenger. Uh, Glenwood Brown, were you surprised by the decision? Uh, yes, I was, you know, because, you know, I kept the pressure. I landed the more solid shots, you know, he threw the flurries, but I landed, you know, more solid shots, and, you know, I feel that. I got robbed in that fight, but uh, you know, I just go back to the ring, back to the gym and take it as a learning experience. All right, let's take a look at the first round knockdown. Describe what happened in that round. Well, there, I was using my jab, and he was coming in with his head, you know, throwing low blows, and there you see I threw an uppercut, went underneath, and came out with a left hook. And he went down. <laughs> then you got him again in the third round, although it was a questionable knockdown on our replays. Did you feel that you had him, that you had intimidated him? Did he change in what he was doing in order to turn the tide of the fight? Uh, you know, yes, I feel that uh, and I was a more stronger fighter. And, you know, he kept on, you know, coming and throwing flurries. But I feel that I threw a lot more harder shots. And he kept coming in with his head. So I, you know, tried to stick to my game plan and box him. And they see I got cut on top of my head, then he butted me on the side. So I was trying to be more cautious on getting on the inside with him. Thank you very much, Glenwood. You put up a great fight. Thank Again, you. to you, Jim. All right, thanks very much, Larry. Incidentally, Meldrick Taylor, as you know, owns one third of the welterweight championship, according to the three major governing bodies. The other two welterweight champions are the clinical technician, Maurice Blocker, and the rock'em sock'em puncher, Buddy McGirt, who vanquished Simon Brown a couple of months ago. I think a fight between McGirt and Taylor, which would actually be a rematch of a fight won by Taylor a few years ago in the 12th round, would be a terrific spectator attraction. A lot of pot potential, but I would advise Taylor not to fight this guy, Brown, in Madison Square Garden. Things could be a lot different. I don't think he is going to fight Brown in Madison Square Garden. I think he'll get the same advice from the Dubas, too, George. <laughs> You're right on the money with that one. Great job tonight. Thanks Enjoyed very it. much. Larry, your final comments on Pernell Whitaker and Meldrick Taylor. Well, they did what they had to do. Pernell Whitaker, a shutout. Uh, Meldrick Taylor uh, won it uh, perhaps in the sixth or seventh innings uh, before he started to dominate the fight. Um, part of what I'm thinking here is going back to the top of the show, and I... Uh, I remember that old song, tell him what you did to yes. Philadelphia Jack O'Brien and then tell him what he did to you. And it sort of worked out that way because uh, Glenwood Brown could tell him a lot of what he did to Taylor tonight, particularly in the early rounds. But um, later in the fight, uh, I think Meldrick Taylor found the formula and, uh, and did it to Glenwood Brown. Um, I've always regarded Philadelphia as the, the best fight town in America, pound for pound. I still think... Julio Cesar Chavez is the best fighter in the world, pound for pound, but uh, we saw two of the better ones here tonight. Sure would be nice to see Chavez take on a name opponent again, maybe in a place like Philadelphia. And in addition to that, I think we saw the extension of two continuing stories with these fighters tonight, Larry, stories that we'll continue to cover here on HBO. Story number one, Pernell Whitaker too good for his own good, it remains difficult for Purnell to find the kinds of opponents who can challenge him in such a way as to help him validate his greatness in public. Story number two is the obvious one. Is Meldrick Taylor 
a hard enough puncher and powerful enough to be the kind of dominant welterweight champion that his natural talents might have given him the chance to be. That's another one that we'll continue to watch here on HBO. So once again, just to wrap up the evening's action, we take you back to Pernell Whitaker's 10-round whitewash decision over Harold Brazier. Whitaker in his first official appearance in a new weight class at 140 pounds. Eventually, he'll be giving up his three lightweight title belts to fight in this division. He took on a man who was fighting in his 90th fight, a terrific sort of conventional boxer, and thoroughly dominated him with his overwhelming skills. And then the exciting battle, a war for the first few rounds between Meldrick Taylor, the defending WBA welterweight champion, and the splendid challenger, Glenwood Brown. Two knockdowns and eventually victory in the bout by unanimous decision for Taylor. We mentioned Philadelphia judging. We should point out that one of the three judges who gave Meldrick Taylor that decision traveled from far away Las Vegas to be here to render her opinion. That was the evening's business. Be sure to join hosts Len Dawson, Nick Bonacati, and Chris Collinsworth on Wednesday, January 22 for HBO's Inside the NFL as they preview this year's Super Bowl. HBO's World Championship Boxing then will return on February 1 with a knockout triple header. A night of the heavyweights. The division's future stars Lennox Lewis, Michael Moore, and Riddick Bowe all continuing their quests toward shot at the titles. And then on February 7, it's the TVKO fight of the month. WBO heavyweight champion Ray Mercer taking on the former heavyweight champion, Larry Holmes. Now stay tuned immediately following tonight's boxing coverage for I Come in Peace on the East Coast and Tango and Cash on the West Coast. And now for Larry Merchant, George Foreman, and Harold Letterman, I'm Jim Lafley saying so long from Philadelphia. The executive producer of HBO Sports is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's telecast produced by Michael J. Whalen and directed by Mark Payton. The feature producers were Brian McDonald and David Hoffman. The associate producer was Kendall Reed. The associate director was Kirby Bradley. Assistance to the producer, Adam Berger, Artie Curry, and Dave Leapson. The production manager was Russell Gabay. And the technical supervisor was Dan Barron.